So I, I would encourage companies to really think on brand earlier in the process. I would think that brand and culture should be the same. Because it's much easier as well to have a single voice internally and externally. So the way you, you should talk and, and treat team members is also the way I think you should treat, talk to and treat customers. In a lot of organizations, those are very different, which makes it more complicated. I like simplicity. Just keep it all the same. It's easier. You're listening to Ecomonics, a Debutify podcast, your resource for one-of-a-kind insights into the world of e-commerce and business in the modern age. This is Joseph. I'll be presenting a wealth of industry knowledge from interviews with successful business people and our own state-of-the-art research. Your time is valuable, so let's go. The fine people at Bonjoro reached out to us and were eager to bring their distinct perspective, brand, service, and information to us, and we were happy to host them. Matt Barnett, the CEO, aka Papa Bear, talks to us about their service that, without spoiling the whole thing here and now, is building towards a life with more profound connection, especially appreciated at a point in time where there is a desperate need for it. So for those worried about a grisly future, you might find instead it can actually be quite warm and fuzzy. Matt Barnett of Bonjoro, it is good to have you here. Thank you for being on Ecomonics. How are you today, sir? I am awesome. Thank you. Great to be here. It's, it's great to have you. And, and I'm happy to point this out in the interest of transparency that your company was the first to reach out to us to want to be on the show. And uh, it gave me a chance to look into something unique that I hadn't had a chance to look into before. And so I definitely want to encourage anybody who... You know, if you if you enjoy this episode, if you enjoy other episodes, feel free to reach out to us. We are trying to complete the ecom puzzle by putting in as many pieces as we can. And Matt brings a very interesting piece today that I'm happy to talk about. So let's start off by warming up the audience with the question of all questions. Who are you and what do you do? Uh, my name is Matt. I am the Papa Bear at the company called Bonjour. I'm based in Australia. We're based around the world. I sit across products on it, and essentially it is a platform that lets you send uh, one-to-one personalized videos at certain points on the customer funnel to either help with new customer conversion, with um, repeat driving repeat purchases, um, or driving reviews, testimonials, and referrals. Now, this platform is what I would... Uh, not what I would refer to is what the uh, website refers to as a customer delight platform. So... The main motif of this is that this is something that you want people to not just feel like they're being kept in touch with, but you want really you just want to make people happy. And the and the motif that you referred to yourself as the pop up bear uh, encapsulates this because this is a company that is about you know fun and positivity and sending a positive message to people. So, uh, did you guys invent the name Customer Delight Platform? And have you seen this idea take root? Have you seen other? Uh, operations or other websites also consider call themselves a customer delight platform? Yeah, so I would say we coined it. I haven't seen it used anywhere else really to date. It, it's kind of like when we say delight, what we're, what we're talking about is something that's um, unexpected to, to a customer. It generates a positive outcome as well. And so I think when you look at that, obviously there's many, many things that can that, that could do this. There's a lot of tools that are used in isolation. And what we're trying to look at is can we start to bring these together i think you know we take kind of a scientific approach that if you're doing delight it's not mm-hmm. just for the sake of doing it you know, the reason is because you're trying to get customers to stay with you as a company for longer like that, that's that's the bottom line we call it um we use it the term lifetime value which is you know it's great to have a customer who buys off you once it's even better to have one who buys off you five times it's even better to have one who buys off you five times and goes and tells everyone else to come and buy off you as well and if you get to that point i think one of the one the, one of the ways to get there obviously great products um, but then outstanding customer service and then just a unique, I think, customer journey that surprises them, shocks them out of their day-to-day routine and gets them to remember you and, and want to go talk about you. Mm-hmm. And th- there, I have a little bit of like a, of a personal um, campaign within my own company is that we do our, we do our meetings and they'll be on Google Meets. Like, yeah, it's Google Meets. And everybody will, have, will be on the call, but one or two people at max will have their videos on. And I personally advocate for it. I believe in having the videos on. And the reason why is because, especially in the time that we're living in right now, where most of us are locked within our own homes, we need every chance we can get to connect with other people. And you can connect with writing, you use your own imagination, but 
the, the difference in connection between writing and seeing somebody, uh, seeing them physically, even you and I, we're looking at each other right now. I know this is an audio podcast, but we turn on the Zoom calls. The difference it makes is substantial, at least in a, from my emotional perspective. But have you guys seen the data to back this up? Have you seen uh, major returns, major improvements in, in customer long-term value? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> there's two parts. There's kind of the science side of it, which is, if you look into how humans communicate, so yeah, we've obviously evolved as social animals. The reason humans are successful is because we were able to function in highly performing groups. Um, but within that, communication was key, and 70% of communication is visual. Like I'm sure you've heard this kind of coin before, but you've obviously got like you know, the tone of voice mm-hmm. is the other part, but um, you know, like how we move, our facial expressions, what the gestures we're doing. So really, when you talk about like using words, being a wordsmith. The reason most of us are bad at this is because this is not natural to us. It, 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 it's it's a learned behavior, whereas communicating face to face isn't. It's an innate behavior that we were born with. So if you look at video, one of the things I'll say is that there's there's really no learning curve. Um, I know some of us get a little bit nervous on video, but if you start talking, it, 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 like video, video is just like uh, we don't even think, we don't even use the word video. We're just right. like we're talking face to face. Like like you you're you're there in Canada. I'm here in Australia. We could be sitting in the same room having the same kind of chat and we'd be like 90% of the way there. Um, on text, I've got no idea like really who you are. So if you look at that and you put that into a funnel, um, what we see is people tend to use us. So one, one, one of the biggest use cases in e-commerce um, is actually driving things like Trustpilot reviews or Google reviews. When you reach out to a customer after you've delivered a product and you say, hey, Jane, just checking in. I want to make sure that what, what you've received is what you expected. If you have any questions about it, please let us know. By the way, if you are happy, reviews mean a lot to us. Please go leave a link here. Um, just taking the time to that. So again, look, there's no training curve here. Anyone, a junior, anyone in the company who's been there three days can get out and do this. It's not hard. And then get a great result rate uh, straight away. And this is probably the difference to, to you know writing or doing email campaigns is you don't have to be a wordsmith. So there's very little training time. So you can get results with very little inputs. If the other side is like as a recipient, when we see someone and we see they're genuine and we can tell that like within seconds of, you know, looking at them, to be honest, in the way they act, you get this trust thing that comes across. Like you can read people, you understand them, you get who they are from your lifetime of, you know, interactions with thousands and thousands of people. And so when you trust them, you go, this is a good person. Like I'll get involved here. And this is not, not even taking the whole delight and like the customer service excellence part into it. It's just a better way to communicate with very little learning curve and as a result we drive you know three times response rates of any other uh, of other comms um, platform you could use Mm -hmm. i also noticed too that there is this i'm calling it an arms race probably just for the fun of it but there's an arms race between the platform and the way that we can communicate with customers and the ability to maintain legitimacy and what i mean by that is that there are a lot of stores out there. I've been a customer of some of these, by the way, where I'll order a product. I keep coming back to this one. Where I talk about this thing called hands-free bracket where they sent this thing. Well, it was delivered, but it was delivered to somebody in Quebec and I never got it. And then I go to the website to see if I can talk to them about it. And then it went down, but Visa took care of me. A uh, point is that, th- I mean, it, that not only made it difficult to trust them because they no longer exist, but it did kind of lower the overall perception of these because i you know i'm on instagram and i'm on facebook and i'm seeing lots of ads and i think before i've had that experience i would probably be skeptical but i was still like you know what i like look, 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 look at this product but because i've been burned by it it does increase the standard for trustworthiness and so what i'm getting from from bonjoro is that it really raises the bar in trustworthiness even beyond writing i find at least like quality writing there is a level of legitimacy to it because okay well somebody had to write this uh, if i was really skeptical i would copy and paste their writing put it into google and see if somebody else had written it and they plagiarized it but you know I, i'll let it go but this is this is a whole new uh this is a whole new game that we're talking about here so how long has this been going on for how uh, if you want to let us know like how you got into this too because i've seen some of the backstory for this um you were working on a different company and you guys started doing this to solve your own problems so let us know like where it is right now in the overall e-commerce space? Yeah, so, so we launched 2017. We, I ran an agency, and so we had a lot of clients. That, you know, if, you, if you live in Australia and you have world aspirations, all your customers mm-hmm. are overseas because great place to live. No one else lives here. So we know all these clients, all these clients and customers in different time zones. So we were using videos where you connect with them. Um, I'm not a wordsmith. 
but I like talking. Uh, and so, you know, I would take a ferry into work, which would go past the opera house, which is pretty, everyone knows. So I would do videos as we went past this and, you know, welcome new, new leads on board. We can't triple down with our response rates. Long story short, one asked if they could use it. We sat in the pub with a few beers and built it. They started using it. Their customers started using it. And then it kind of overtook the original business. So it, 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 was, sol- it was to solve a pain point of our own um, where, you know, we were great face-to-face. We weren't great online and time zones just through a whole kind of spanner in the works. Um, we then started, you know, we started kind of following that rabbit hole, if you like. It wasn't like we started off on day one with a strategy to go mm-hmm. and take over the world. Uh, we were just, we actually got quite surprised by it all, and we're like, okay, like, let's let's see where this goes. Um, as a result, e-coms was was starting to kind of grow as a customer base. Like last year, I'd say, kind of started to come in um, off a few use cases, and then as of March this year, there was a fundamental switch where you know we went from of probably like four percent of our user base to like 20 percent of our user base, um, which is massive. Um, because we're quite a big use base anyway. And that has been driven by obviously a takeoff of e-commerce this year. We've kind of started to get into very much around the review space. The other thing is I've seen a lot of changes in e-commerce models. Um, and one of those is moving to um subscription models. So I was reading the other day, something like, you know, it used to be like seven percent of e-commerce pre this year was um offered subscription models. I think now it's fourteen percent, which is again. An, an insane change and because you have these subscription models you have e-commerce companies looking at this thing mm-hmm. called lifetime value seriously for the, for the first time which is when you have someone paying you on a monthly basis or, you know, or an annual basis how do you make sure that person keeps paying you keeps paying you and stays longer and so you start to get in almost into the same mentality that you'd have in you know, SaaS and kind of software companies which is you know, how much they're worth over the lifetime? What is their churn rate? How do we keep them longer? And so you start to get into retention, and so and that's where we're where we traditionally we use mostly. And now e-commerce is starting to pick this up, um, and so it's interesting. You see this kind of blend of where where e-commerce is starting to you know, move into like mm. software subscriptions, and you start to see this blend over. And and because we play, play in that space, we've been very effective. And e-commerce is a very um, process driven environment. Um, and the way that our platform works is that it's not off the cuff. It's always you know customer did X send the video so we're very much a process driven system it fits and kind of melds with that perfectly now is that uh, the only part of the of the funnel where it just it's just applied in the uh, retention or have uh, customers or even you guys uh, considered or implemented it in other parts of the funnel as well like have you tried using it during acquisition or decision or any part or any other part of that yeah so across the customer base we use all parts of the funnel so we used a lot in so reason sales we used in inbound lead conversion we used an activation if you're online courses and SaaS, we used in upgrades and retention and then referrals and then we use at the end of the funnel in kind of generating advocacy and getting people to kind of talk about you uh, which which i think is the most exciting part of the funnel because i think a lot of companies fail here i uh, i think we all have a habit of focusing on new customers um mm-hmm. i think on, on new customers first, I think next thing is like, okay, retention of existing customers. This little thing called advocacy or super fans, and this point I think is awesome, yeah, is making people, don't get 10,000 customers, get 1,000 that love you and that will go and talk about you like openly online and at events and wherever else. And if you can get it to happen, then, then each of those 1,000 people bring you 10 more leads. Like that's your business for life. Um, I think getting that to happen as a process is hard to do. Um, I think, again, most of us kind of get part of the way there. But I think if you if you focus on things like delight and surprise, this is the kind of stuff that makes you stand out. This is the kind of stuff that connects customers with your team and your people. This is the kind of stuff where people are going to go, these guys are different, and they're going to actually want to go and talk proactively about you. If you never get that to happen, you've just solved your biggest growth lever. And it's free and it's cheap, and the leads that come in from that are always much more highly converting. Um, so that's kind of the area of funnel I think is actually the most exciting, most untouched. And I'll rant for hours if you let me. But, you know, we come in all parts. If any part needs to be, needs to be solved and any part I would say any business to focus on, I'd, I'd actually be looking at that side rather than the top of the funnel. Mm-hmm. So actually, one thing I want to get back to, because you were talking about subscription models. And there, it, just from my experience having... I've done a couple of subscriptions and I'm only, and I'm, by the way, I'm only talking about physical media. I'm not talking about Netflix for this. So I break them down into two sides. There's consumable product. So let's just say I, a dollar shave club, for instance, there's, I only use it so much. 
uh, by the time I'm done with it, there, there's another one in. And actually, I am on a subscription model right now. I subscribe to Quip, so I get the electric toothbrush every three months. Um, and then on the other side, there is, and I don't know if this is the official term for it, but I guess I would call it accumulative subscription models where you're getting like t-shirts or you're getting toys or doodads or cups. Um, and I think that there's a more of a difficulty with the accumulative ones. Cause I think people get burned out of those where, okay, this is like the eighth box that I've gotten now. This is like the eighth shirt. I'm gonna have to start giving them to my friends. So have you noticed that there is a more difficulty in one side or the other and what people have done to uh, address keeping people from burning out on a product that they can't eat unless they eat shirts, which no one does. That's crazy. I don't know why I said that out loud, but you understand my meaning. Yeah, yeah. Look, so, look consumables, absolutely. If you haven't looked at subscriptions seriously as, as a consumables um, company, then you should be doing that. And it's hard, by the way. Like, it's hard because now everyone's jumping in. <laughs> if you'd done it a year ago, you'd be winning. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think in terms of non-consumables, look, so the models I see work better here are where there's variation um, and potentially delight and surprise again. So one of the things you're paying for here is to be surprised, delighted, and, and, and to have an unexpected result. So harder with the T-shirts model, but like the whole idea of of boxes and you know boxes around x or y or z like so like kids toys is one so i think there's like one of the ones like some of the ones i've seen that have done really well are uh, like learning platforms for children and the point here is that with with a child they're going through development and so they're changing over time and so when these boxes are coming in though the ones that are done well are leveling up and they're offering different um, things to do, different activities over a lifetime of a child. Now, if you take that same kind of mentality and you apply it to like adults, we also have things where where we learn and we change over time. So it might be that you, I mean, you, you can have you can have su- subscriptions on selling education, you know, like like a one extreme. But obviously, you're going to be getting better and better, and therefore you're learning through. It, you know, if it's things that you are learning to do, so you might be doing courses in, uh, I don't know, let's let's say, um like modeling, let's say, mm-hmm. then what you're doing there is you're getting more and more complex models over time rather than just the same stuff again and again. So I, I, I think when you do this, ah. you want to, and this is one this is one area of it, but I think if you're in the area, if you know where you can challenge users and so each time they get it, they're, they're experiencing something different, that's the key. And so if you take that like full circle back to T-shirts, then my suggestion would be you need to try wildly different fashions and types um you know where a user could be like am i a wife beater guy i'll i'll whatever like it's here i'll put it on and see if it works i mean i mean, I mean maybe that may as one element so again i'm just kind of riffing here but i think if you can mix things up and so this comes back to the delight so if you go back to the light the light doesn't work if you do the same thing again and again you can do something amazing right Send every customer, you know, sponsor a koala for a customer, yeah? And they're like, oh, this is amazing. I get baby koala pictures. Do that again and again and again. They're like, I've already got 18 koalas and sponsoring. Like, it's no longer surprising. So, you know, next time sponsor an ostrich or next time like, do, do something different. Yeah. I think you have to, like, like the human mind likes acceleration. So, yeah, it's the same as being in the car. We, we thrive on, on change. So you know, new experiences and change. So like driving 100 Ks an hour, 100 miles an hour, isn't that exciting? Going from 20 miles an hour to 40 miles an hour in two seconds, like that's exciting, even though it's a much lower bar. So again, the change, it's not about having the most amazing thing and the most expensive thing and the best product. It's about changing that dynamic. And mm-hmm. that's what keeps us interested as a human. So I think maybe maybe just think creatively around that and how you can bring that into what it is that you're offering and if you have a system that is not subscription but you think you can you can, you can play on this start to consider it seriously it's very it's like subscriptions are easy to test there's loads of plug and play solutions shopify has like plug and play payment solutions for subscriptions you can just test it if no one buys it you know you haven't lost anything you know when you mention child uh, education and mathematics given my own mathematical skills which are lacking i'd realize maybe I should just get one of those anyways. Keep, keep it around for when I do have a kid. Just, just to run through my bed mass again, just just for the sake of it. A great answer, by the way. That led out uh, quite, quite a few uh, new ideas that even I hadn't uh, considered. So I go through the Bonjour website um, as part of my uh, preparation, and 
One quote sticks out to me is that Bonjour says, it sends videos and to leads and customers at just the right moment. Now, I, I, that to me, initially, initially, I think, okay, well, there's like a trigger there where um, if they say like the f- they find out that it's delivered and it's integrated with a delivery app, they say, okay, it's delivered, send the video. Now, did I nail it? Or like, will I be using my data to figure out the best time? Or is this something that Bonjoro has data to share with the customer and can actually figure out when is the optimal time to send it? Yeah, so you kind of nailed it there, is that we do it in response to triggers. So at the moment, it's a little bit more simple. So we actually are investing in, 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 in trying to tell you when to do this exactly. Um, but so for instance, we actually have all these, these, these things called funnels where you can kind of plug and play and we'll set up for you. So if if it is doing um, driving with trust part, part reviews or kind of, of um, or Google reviews, there's two common triggers. One is straight after purchase. Uh, the, the better trigger is actually straight off, off the delivery. So if you have your app which right. tells you it's been delivered, we actually suggest like, like a 24-hour wait period. After delivery, let them open it first. And then, and then the pretense is the wrong word here, but the reason you're reaching out is for customer service excellence. So you're actually checking in to make sure they're happy with the product. And that is like everyone's going to gonna open that and kind of watch that because of that reason. But the real reason you're doing it is because at the end of it, if you are happy... Here's a review link, go here. So it, it, these are pre-built funnels that we have where they're proven before, where, where other, other e-commerce customers have used these and we know that these work. There's also a free form function. So if you want to build other triggers, which might be, you know, we have customers who, who go, look, we'll wait until someone's done a third purchase. And we'll own, because we have a thousand a day, we'll wait only for people who've done three purchases or more. And we'll segment out those mm-hmm. and we'll only contact those because we know those are, repeat customers that is, is, is worth us spending our time on those to drive them on to either discounts for thank yous, you know, high ticket items, premium items, or subscription models at that point, or reviews, testimonials, etc. So you can kind of build these out and build these funnels. We try and pre-build as much as we can for you. Over time, you will see us, we are looking into the intelligence side more. So can we almost look into your Shopify data and say, hey, based on what we've seen on a thousand other other, other e-commerce customers, and based on what you do and your ticket price, the system's gonna gonna say don't don't send videos to these customers, send to these ones, because that's where you're gonna get your ROI on time. Because because there, there is a time cost mm-hmm. to this. Absolutely. And so it has to work for you as a company in terms of time versus the extra revenue it makes you as a company. Yeah, and I think it also depends too on what expectations you set for the brand. So just pulling an example out of thin air, if there was uh, a brand that had a lot of strength in photography or videography. Obviously, they would want to use the this video for uh, for that. So it's not like it's just a, a quick thank you note from uh, from the CEO or something. It might be something a little bit more involved. So it would be up to the user to decide how much resources they want to put into it. But I I can see how it could end up kind of getting away from them, and then they end up spending a little bit too many resources into it. Yeah. So. We're gonna get we're gonna get back to like into the in, uh, integration and some of the more technical stuff. Um, but there's something that I'm dying to ask you, and we established this in our in our pre chat about the vision for this because being uh, a reasonably large nerd, one of the first things that uh, crossed my mind when I'm discovering this is the sci fi implications of this. Um, anybody who's seen, yeah, you've you, you've seen a I don't know, I guess Star Trek, but. I don't know if they have. Yeah, they, they, they've done it in Star Trek. I'm pretty sure Blade Runner did it. But the idea of checking um, direct messages from each other and those messages being video messages is where this is all going. And I'm hard pressed to see that not happening. I'm not really sure. Like, I, I don't see us regressing from video back to text or from audio. I really think that it will get to the point. And you mentioned earlier that we don't really like calling it a video. We're just doing it because we can't help it. So. Where do you see the uh, the future of growth for this? Where do you think this is going to end up? And what infrastructure are we looking at right now that's kind of like getting in the way of keeping us from, say, being able to send messages via SMS? Yeah, so we actually think about of where we go with this is actually the idea of personalization at scale. And and, and we, we're trying to think of like, like the right, so we haven't got the right term here because like everything, personalization has kind of been ruined by marketers. So I'm like, okay, what we actually mean is like, is like actual personalization, you know, authentic personalization, where, it, where you are actually spending 30 seconds for Jenny from Oklahoma, who's brought X, 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 like XYZ, rather than just, you know, dropping in like, like, like an F name tag. 
first of all about that there's a huge movement towards personalization obviously like like any any comms this is not just comms but like offering up ads at the right time you know if someone's doing consumer products like offering you know re- retargeting at the right time when they're ready to consume that product again uh, there's a whole piece around personalization i think when you then bring that into so video naturally just falls into this anyway um i think there is a point you want to get to on that where every customer experience is different and it's unique to the individual and they feel valued for it it's not it's not all automation there we always say like we'll automate process not relationships that that's kind of the key here when you start thinking about video and where this goes from here i mean it's, it's not so living in australia we're a very multicultural especially in kind of sydney and kind of melbourne very multicultural city we are a country of immigrants i'm, I'm an immigrant i'm from the uk originally and so you always see, mm-hmm. I remember like going to work on the trains and the ferries very early on here, you'd see people every morning on Skype, on their phones to family in other, in other countries. It was always personal. So it's very much um, consumer to consumer rather than kind of business use. That starts to shift when now you're starting to see it on business more. This year's accelerated that. And so I think you get to a stage where I, I don't think writing and audio will go away. I think they have their place. Mm-hmm. Um I've, I've even read stuff that audio is, is actually on, on the rise now as well, because I think things like running and stuff, you know, like you, like that's starting to come into play. And this is why podcasts have kind of kicked off massively. Um, but I think in terms of just quick messages, comms, videos, it's coming into all points of that comms platform. I think there's data moves that have helped this. I mean, here in Australia now, we're starting to launch 5G. Don't tell the conspiracy theorists, but it's all pretty good. Um, and that now <laughs> means that data's, like, so here, data is not a concern. It just isn't anymore. And you can be in the desert in Australia, which is pretty barren, and you get perfect network. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy. So I think the, the limitations that have been lifting, we see in kind of third world countries, so places like, you know, uh, Malaysia, Africa, that's obviously a little bit behind that, but that is catching up massively. I was in Vanuatu the other year, and you're on these islands in the middle of nowhere where they don't necessarily have clean sanitation, and yet everyone is on Facebook on their phones, and you're like, oh, this is... Like, like it kind of hits home and you're like, this is the future. So I think if you go back to the side of things, I think video is just a natural way to, com- to, to, to communicate. I think we're now training ourselves. I think there is a training thing because I think traditionally video has been on a pedestal and we think of film and TV, not not what mm-hmm. we're doing now. And now everyone's realizing, oh, it doesn't matter. So I think it's time to happen. We're becoming, we're becoming a more disconnected world as well. With Like me and you encounter, here's, here's a great example. This is normal now for us. So that will happen. And then, and then you start to think, okay, well then where do you go next? And it's, it's like a okay, VR has never really taken off. And I'm like, of course it hasn't because you can't go from text to VR. You have to go to video first and then you have to go to, you know, augmented video and kind of a more in depth video. And, and, and you have to train people to communicate that way. And then when you start to put people in environments, so me and you could be sitting in a room now having, having a virtual coffee together, suddenly that starts to make sense. It never, it never did before because who's going to do that? Everyone has to have it for it to work. When everyone's got video, you can't like most of the way there. You're just giving it another little nudge. So I think we're getting to that. I think that will happen now a lot sooner than it would have done. I think, again, it's inevitable that with me in Australia and you in Canada, I would love to be sitting in, in a room with you where I could see, because right now I can see your face, but I can't see your, your, your gestures. And, 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 and like, I have no idea how tall you are or if you're skinny or if you're fat, like everything else, like, which all kind of like, influences how you think about people so i think that's the next stage we're going to so i've talked a lot there about a lot of things but yeah and you also can't well maybe you could figure it out but i'm recording in my closet because it's the most soundproof <laughs> room in the, in the apartment yeah uh, so i don't know maybe some things are left <laughs> better uh better left on undiscovered not that i might or anything um but there's a couple of interesting points there that you that you raised and one of them is about well, there is a, there is an inherent value to video because uh, you're saying that audio and writing will always have their place and they will um, I mean, I think uh, once people will realize at scale how uh, harmful uh, light can be uh, closer to your bedtime, I think books will actually have a resurgence. And in fact, they probably already have where people will want to get back to reading at the end of the day or even at the beginning of the day before they blind themselves first thing in the morning. But also with video is that and, by, and me from my background is I did um, I did background acting for about a year and a half, two years. I enjoyed it immensely. Even at some of the really hard days, it was a blast. And they're filmmakers, so it's just they're just making making movies. People pay pay money. Well, you know, once upon a time, they go to theaters, uh, buy popcorn, and they eat it. The amount of resources that went into making a film blew my mind. 
um, a quick story for comparison's sake. So uh, I was in the the Handmaid's Tale, and I was uh, in background for a scene where uh, the, one of the characters is just walking up the subway from the train to the outside, having a conversation. That took eight hours by the time that we showed up to get our wardrobes all sorted out, to to get in place, takes reshoots, moving the cameras around, different angles. And then I sat in the theater and I watched uh, 1917. And knowing what I know about how hard filmmaking is, I was just blown away by the work that goes into it. So so when you say that um, video, I don't know, people might not be getting it like the, the correct amount of credit. It actually does have like a lot of inherent credit to it because I think we recognize inherently the resources that go into it. We recognize that there is data involved, there's batteries involved, there's light involved. And also, depending on how you make the video, there is audio and there is writing involved in it as well. So that's just one point that I want to uh, draw about video is that it does encapsulate a lot of what makes a quality experience. The other point that I want to raise about VR, uh, it appeals to gamers because gamers are used to projecting themselves into a, an alternate reality through the usage of an avatar. Even though we're just picking up a controller and we're just playing a character on screen, depending on how immersive the game is, through the use of video and audio um, and also the freedom to control something, uh, that does immerse into it. So I have noticed that virtual reality has been more accepted in the gaming community than in, I don't know, accounting or anything like that. I think I think you'll see it in so I think you'll see it in personal situations first. So I, I, I would argue it will follow the exact same direction that video did. Um, it's interesting because like audio and telegrams was all about business and kind of like uh, before it, it, it wasn't personal because of cost. Whereas now, video again back to example, it was always Skype first, which has been knocked off its off its throne by by things like Zoom, which is which is predominantly business because and that's just has happened. VR. So again, because like you said environments and, and trust and everything else you know I, I would probably use it to sit in the room with my dad and have a have a glass of wine and he's in the uk and i'm here in australia that that's where we'd use it first like first and foremost gamers are using it with friends and trusted environments and it's very immersive uh, and they're also using other realities but there's no reason why vr couldn't just be my room here with my couch it doesn't have to be exciting and immersive uh, there's obviously that element to it but i think when you start to think it has to sure. be that you, you're missing the point it's more about it's about triggering your brain to believe that you're in that you're there with someone, which again, because of six billion years of evolution, is going to trigger in certain behaviors and make you more comfortable and make you feel more connected to that individual. So I think that's really what you're looking to do. Business wise, it will come in at the point that it's needed. Again, it will come in when everyone has it, because the problem with VR is if any one of you has it, it doesn't doesn't matter for everyone else. Um, so again, personal, mm -hmm. I think, will happen first. I don't think it's here now. I just think the fact that we're so comfortable on video and the fact that we are dropping that pedestal means that stepping into VR eventually will be like, oh, oh yeah, this is fine. We're, you know, not not we're weirded out or whatever else. And, and then obviously access, you know, like cost, cost and uh, like market penetration of devices is a huge part of this. So one of the easy ways, you know, we'd have to get on a, on a massive headset. How's that going to work? That's the other barrier to overcome. But we've come over. We, we we've overcome many other technological i mean i'm here with like electricity and aircon and mm -hmm. you know everything it's it, like this will just happen again i think i think you raise a really good point there one of them the one thing that sticks out to me as a, um is maybe instead of the the headset it would actually go more like the holographic route where people would just like project themselves into it uh yeah okay Th those are those are those are fair points uh so let's get back to uh let's get back to bonjour let's get back to integrations and the technical side of this um so can you go through the integrations for our for our listeners, how uh, Bonjour is uh, integrated or what integrations are going with it? Because uh, I know I looked at it and I didn't see SMS yet, but we've touched on the, like, we're not working on that. So what other integrations are you looking forward to getting uh, involved in? Yeah, so there's two sides. So one is obviously on the customer data side. So yeah, we plug directly into Shopify. We also plug into, if you use... Um, ESP, so email systems or CRMs. As a side of Shopify, we plug into pretty much all of those as well. So wherever your customers are living, we're plugging in, and then there's different triggers, different, different points of the funnel. So if you're taking people off, you've got your e-commerce side. If you've also got like, like a marketing element, we'll plug into that as well. Um, in terms of delivery, uh, we started predominantly with email because it's the one thing everyone has. We are actually playing around with SMS and looking to it right now. We're looking around social. We're looking around maybe on website messaging too. Um, so we're just looking to reach people wherever they are. We're starting to do things like screen recording as well um, and videos that you can reuse. So 
maybe not so um, useful within e-coms, but in other systems, we people are using it for demos and to walk through accounts, that kind of thing. Um, but I think on, on the side, I think the customer data side is really interesting. I, I think when you have things like you're using like Shopify and using MailChimp as an example, what's interesting is we see customers who plug us into both and then you're seeing the same customers in Shopify and MailChimp and maybe not that journey is a little bit disparate. And so we're in the middle and we're like, we, we, we can connect the dots for you. So we can show you that mm-hmm. you've sent four marketing messages and that's triggered someone to come into an EDM and that person's gone bought, bought and then they've ended up repurchasing 10 times. And so what, what we can show you is that you know, this action has resulted in this, and you saying a video in the middle has, you know, has driven, again, like this much more value. So it's trying to try and connect those dots of where your customers live and try and, again, help you decide where you should be investing, like personal time. So this is kind of outside the automation side. I think that's like, pretty inter- interesting as well. Um, so really just try and help you tie your data sources together, try and help you complete, like, what's the word I'm for? Clean customer journeys rather than like a hundred things. Going. Seamless. <laughs> so that's the word, that's the word, yeah. yeah. Seamless customer journeys. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I, I, I'm a, I'm a fan of pitching. You were you were trying to come up with another word for personalization, and that's now running in my in my um back end of internal software to try to think of another word for it. I hate to say it, but I think personalization might end up being the winner. Yeah. I'm just, but then how do you how do you how do you I mean this is a, this is a brand perception thing. How do you differentiate that from because a lot of people like personalization. They're like so you just you know. It automatically says someone's name, and I'm like, no, no, we, you have to, you have to put the time in and do it. They're like, oh, some people are like, oh, hyper personalization. I'm like, that's not the right word. <laughs> but yeah, I'm like, yes, like that is it. So this is this is this is a conundrum with like with the language. You know, you get like someone comes up with something, it works for a while, and everyone's like, okay, that's not working anymore. Let's put Uber on top, and then hyper, and then and then it just destroys itself and <laughs> crushes it. And then you have to come up with a new word. So I feel like it's just one of those like it's, yeah, inevitable. That we'll get. It's it's running in my back end. I've got top men on it. So if I if I get a if I get an idea, I'll just email yeah, you. Sure. Uh, or or maybe you'll be in the middle of uh, of your next um, uh, answer to the question. I'll just be like, I got it. Right, right. Um, collect, you know, with the data that you're collecting, you, you, we we talked about how you've been able to make some pretty unique observations about the e-commerce space. I feel like you've brought up some of them already, but just to make sure, are there any other uh, unique observations about the e-commerce that you wanted to bring to the table? Let's, I mean, so what, one thing I would say is, is where we're doing, I, I would start looking into, I would start reading probably around how software companies have traditionally thought about customers in terms of value. Uh, this idea, I, I keep mentioning lifetime value. Um, it wasn't a term that was used in e-coms 12 months ago. I used to always have to explain it. And now people are like, oh yeah, lifetime value. And they understand churn, they understand retention and um, upgrades and, and, and like whatever else. So I, I think one of my suggestions would be, if you're not familiar with that space, start to have a look because these are companies that have dug so deep onto the entire customer lifetime journey that goes over, you know, potentially 10 years, not not today. And so if you look to where you're going to go down the line, things you can do today that will benefit you in, in five years' time. I think the deeper you can go in understanding how all these metrics into play and you know, what what is churn, you know, it doesn't even matter if you if you don't have a a, a subscription model. But what is repeat? What is the value of a repeat customer? Like, 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 how much should you invest in that versus new leads and everything else? And so, I think the deeper you can understand this, and then also understand how software companies have traditionally approach growth, where they're always looking for like you hear these growth hacks. It, it's a terrible term. Don't get too sucked in. But the idea of looking for unique growth levers for you rather than just copycatting all the other e-commerce companies and thinking more creatively around it. Again, I, my suggestion would be software has really dug into this so hard and now i see e-commerce like i think e-commerce is still in, in, in its infancy like strangely enough I, I think it's a booming industry it's going to go faster than like anything right now I th- like i think it's a really exciting space to be but with that and the fact it is quite early i still think brings massive amounts of, of opportunity for those of you that are willing to think outside the box and uh, again my, my suggestion is any idea you have isn't going to be new so look to other industries, um, I think software is be a good one, like alongside you and look at that and go, what can we borrow from that and apply in the e-commerce space that maybe other e-commerce companies haven't thought about. You know, over over this, um, some of my, my subconscious has been trying to pitch like creative ideas for me because they don't know when to uh, leave me alone. But there are a lot of different things that I can imagine uh, different brands would do for communicating with their customers. Like, 
if if a, if, a, if it was a sequence of videos where there was like a story to it, where each time they they receive their subscription, they receive the video that continues the story, and maybe the story is tied into something they receive. Um, in the same way, the comic subscriptions would keep people hooked because what well, or drama, dramatic television keeps people hooked. It's like you know, keep subscribing, and then you can you can find out what happens. So that's just me, just kind of like a, a spitballing because I always enjoy the creative process. Um, what I do want to know uh, is. You know the videos themselves. What uh, exactly are people doing? What are some of the practices that you recommend for people putting together good videos? And yeah, like more. Let's just focus on the actual videos themselves for a second. What are people saying to their customers? Yeah. So again, it, it, in the way that we use video, where it is very much a comms and kind of checking you in. Like number one thing, don't think about it too much. Like, to be honest, that's probably the best advice I can give. Uh, don't. It's not about getting your hair done. Perfect. I mean, don't look like a. I mean, like, 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 like you know, have it with your brand, but m- like twenty percent of our videos are shot while people like it used to be on commutes to work. Now that we're a bit more, a, a bit more of a um a remote world, people in parks, people on like I mean, now most videos are shot in the home rather than the office. Um, if your kids run in, don't worry, keep keep shooting. People love like this is all about authenticity as well, you know. So like like the more open you are. The more transparent you are, often the better that comes back. So, yeah, you know, for me, Im- imperfection is beauty. Imperfection is is what people trust because none of us are perfect. Well, most of us aren't perfect. I, mm-hmm. I, I definitely aren't. Um, I, I definitely am not. <laughs> um, so, if you <laughs> if you get imperfection in the videos, that's a good thing, and you'll learn this because you'll start doing it and you'll start saying them, and then people will resp- and you'll think, oh, I didn't look perfect there, and people respond and be like, thanks so much. This, this meant this meant a lot, a lot to me, and so. I think when you when you start to get the results, that will like you can't help it. That'll educate you anyway. So, so the number one thing I say with videos is, is is don't think about it too much. Always have an ask, and this is with the business hat on. Mm-hmm. Is when you're communicating with customers, like you're doing it, you're, you're doing it for a reason. You know, you don't you need to be shy about that, and, and that's okay. There's nothing nefarious there. But are you asking customers to follow you on social? Are you asking them to join? A, a club or a discount system are you asking to subscribe or leave a review etc cetera, etc cetera. so again think about where you're driving customers and think about you know potentially if you've got someone hooked and you've spent time doing something that's really good and they're going to love like you, you're allowed to ask, you're allowed to ask for something back because it's a law of reciprocation you've done something but like you have you have stopped in your day but most of your competitors won't so don't be like afraid of that um yeah and then I mean, like, honestly, like that's kind of it. Timing, timing is the only thing I, I would say is just again work out those the, the, those trigger points and funnels. If someone buys something, d- d- don't send a video a month later. Um, you know, mm-hmm. strike while the iron is is hot and kind of relevant. I would say, but you'll work out very quickly what your style is and what is working for you. But I can guarantee on day one you'll probably get eighty percent of the results. So it's, it, most results you get on day one. Getting to perfection takes time, but it's not like shooting a high def video where on day one you get 10% and then you have to learn over the next two years. Um, it's mm-hmm. not that hard. Um, what are some, have you seen any uh, unique approaches to the video from your customers or clients or, well, I, I know that uh, based on your, your company culture, you really just like to think, think of them as your friends, but um, I think I, I just wanted to pick like, what was the best word for them? But yeah. Look, be, I mean, I, I'm a creative, be, my suggestion is be creative. My, my, Involve your brand or what you do in the videos, and you'll and that's a clear winner. So, like some example, I have we have a, a coffee roaster um, who was using these to mm. send that messages to second time. Per- so, anyone who bought for second time or more, so we do it first time, he would then send that message. He'd be like, "Did you know you've got a subscription? If you do this, you'll, you'll save money." Obviously, if they were with a fifth time purchaser, he'd be like, "You're going to save this much money. Here's a dis- discount." He would shoot, or him and his team would shoot all of this while they were roasting down in the. I don't know if factory is the right word, wherever it is, they, the, the bean roasting area. Um, and they would do it with the stuff behind them. And so you get these. And so what they start to do is position their team as not connoisseurs, the kind of uh, as like artists, like, like, and here they are and they're doing the roasting. And so you would get a bit of that brand coming across people like, this is real. These guys are actually doing the roasting there. It's not, it's not that they're shipping it in from another country or whatever. And so when they do that, people love the fact they were brought into it. Now, now my suggestion is, it's not about the fact that we're coffee roasting. If you do this in a warehouse where you're shipping, it, it, it's interesting, yeah. Like most of us haven't seen that side of things. Whatever you're doing, there's, there's a you know, there's a company who, there's a company who do window cleaning, dressed in kilts. 
<laughs> I don't know why that's the thing. And so all the videos on them with their cleaning and kilts, and it's 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 hilarious. And there's a you know, and you know, there's a there's a company who does like who does beard. We have a few companies who do beer products. Apparently, it's, it's quite a, it's quite a big niche. Uh, the one company, the guy, uh, dresses up as a knight and speaks in you know Renaissance uh, English uh, as a knight and talks about beer products. Oh, yeah, that's and pretty it's cool. Hilarious. And and so obviously he's not doing those. Like it's all he does is he waits the evening and then he does you know the videos are all one kind of batch. Um, but people think it's hilarious, and it and it, and it ties into his brand. And his brand is called Fable Beard, so it's all about you know, this is kind of the piece here. Yeah. So when you can tie it together and you can you can tie in your brand to the messaging, I mean that's that's how you get the last twenty percent that I was talking about. That's how you get the videos where people are, are, are mind blown. And if you can make people laugh, I mean we all know that that works wonderfully. Um, but bring them into your world; it's it's interesting. Like what what you do, I don't care what your industry is, is fascinating because other people don't experience it. So think about that. There's a thought that uh, came into my head. I chambered it for a little bit here, but I want to get it. Uh, I just want to get it some oxygen. I'm I'm going to call this the creative crusade, where I would say within the last ten to fifteen years, the creative side of, well, I guess the world has found new pathways into the business world. Um, even somebody like an accountant or something that people might consider to be rather you know drab can end up doing a podcast or can end up doing something uh, fun to show their 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 backside because of their personality. And yeah, I just wanted to point that out because I think we're in one of the things that creative people bring to the table is their ability to understand the need for connection and to find ways to connect people to one another. So I wouldn't want to discourage anybody from from attempting this, even if they're doing a business that they consider themselves to be rather introverted or insular. There's in fact, I would recommend it more because it would amplify that connection. It would it would make them stand out over all of the other, let's just say, accountants who, again, keeping to themselves and aren't considering this kind of thing. But look, uh, in terms of creativity, like ever, like we've all got creativity. It, it, it's natural human trait um, within us. If you're solving problems in any way, that's a creative process. So they, I, like there are things like we think about creativity. Everyone thinks artists and musicians, and like that's not. That's one form of creativity. You have creative accountants, and that's what makes them like awesome accountants. Anyone who thinks sure. out of the box and goes and goes and um, problem solves, you know, and, and there's a whole, there's a whole thing with like education, like suppressing creativity and how we've done it, you know, which, which is being addressed, I think, anyway. But I'm telling you, like, you've all got creative bones in your body, so I think it, it's just about thinking outside the box and problem solving. Everyone's got it. Like I believe everyone's got it, got, got it within them. I, I, think the, I think the way that we think about creativity naturally is, is actually wrong. Okay, that, that's a fair point. Uh, I just wanted to point out for myself that maybe there is like a, a disconnect between the people who like identify themselves as creative because I mean, yeah. of their main pursuit yeah. versus yeah. the the inherent trait within everybody. Because we all have a drive to create, even if in the most uh, basic fundamental human sense to create life and to, and to start a family. So that so that part is absolutely true. Um, and yeah, I can also say that I've. I've made friends with a lot of people who had uh, distinctive talents in art or singing, and they never pursued it because of uh, the way our educational system, which, as you pointed out, is working on fixing this, of just discouraging people from it because it's not transactional or there's no money to be made in it. Well, I can say that's not true anymore. There's lots of things uh, even the most creatively inclined people can do to, to get into the industry. So. I think, I think here's the thing, yeah, don't, don't use that as an excuse. Don't say, I'm not creative, therefore I'm going to sit in front of a white wall and do my videos there. Um, yeah. like, it's, not, it's not a good enough excuse. Like, like th there are things you can do that people will love. It's, it's very simple. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're, we're, we're around the, the bend to, uh, before we got to wrap this up. So the last thing I want to talk to you about is just, a, you know, your overall brand. Uh, and I think we transitioned pretty well into this is, you know, where you got the idea for the bear motif and also, um, just talk about your company culture and what you do to uh, encourage creativity in your in your in your team members. Yeah, so because of what we do, uh, and, and to be honest, the, the brand has driven the product development. Like in the end, anyway, we're very open, transparent, and pretty kind of wacky, eccentric group. I would say uh, that works for us. Mm -hmm. Like as a result, we're looking at branding. We're like, look, I think a character would be quite fun here. Um, I don't even remember where the, where the bear came. It kind of. Like many things, it's kind of built from there. So we start with a bear, 
logo. Now we send bear costumes to kids at certain points of the journey. That every every new team <laughs> member who signs up, I was mentioning earlier, gets a new a custom bear suit they can build with a bunch of grannies in the north of England that knit it for them. We sponsor koalas. We sponsor some bears in in um in the Ukraine as well. Um, so we kind of just went deep on that because we thought it was funny. Like <laughs> that no other reason. Um, turns out other people think it's funny too. I I, I think with us. Because what we're we're trying to inspire customers to let loose a little bit and be more be a bit more creative, be more transparent, be themselves, be more confident. Therefore, we take our brand a little bit more extreme on that front to try and drag customers part of the way with us. We have people mm-hmm. who come into our into our into our funnel and they're like, "Oh, I think you guys are too childish for us." I'm like, "That's cool. This probably isn't going to work for you anyway. If you think that, you're probably not going to do a good job of the videos because if you're not willing to let go, then it's not right for you." So. But we're very happy to turn customers, customers away who do not fit our brand, and we've made a conscious decision for that. Um, I would argue that most companies should be a bit more forceful with their brand. I think a lot of companies fall in the trap of just another brand where you, you kind of, again, this is with, with the creative hat on. And then I think brand and culture are synonymous. I don't think they're distinct at all. So the way we hire and the team that we have and the attitudes we look for, we actually hire on culture first because if they're not slightly eccentric, if they're not easygoing, if they're not willing to um, go go camping with the rest of the team, and you know, we fly like our team around the world, so we're like US and US, Europe, uh, South Africa, and Australia, and then the Philippines. We're we're very global. We bring everyone together, and we all hang out as mates. And if someone doesn't fit that, I, like I don't care how good you are as a developer or as a product manager or, or you know as an SDR, you're not going to get past the starting line. So I I would encourage companies. To really think on brand earlier in the process, I would think that brand and culture should be the same because it's much easier as well to have a single voice internally and externally. So the way you, you should talk and, and treat team members is also the way I think you should treat, talk to and treat customers. In a lot of organizations, those are very different, which makes it more complicated. I like simplicity. Just keep it all the same. It's easier. Right. And and you don't have to even argue just uh, simply from an, an emotional side. Like this does reflect well in overall productivity. If you endear, And this is the point that I wanted to make at the beginning of the episode where I'm encouraging you know my own uh, teammates to have their videos on when we have calls so that we can look at each other is that when you endear your teammates to one another, that boosts happiness. And when you boost happiness, that boosts productivity. So I'm, we, don't, we don't have to be sappy. We could if we want to, but we don't have to. We just have to say this boosts productivity. This retain, this creates better loyalty. Uh, and, and even as you say, it creates a more cohesive brand, uh, both uh, internally and externally. And it gives people an easier time uh, conveying that voice to one another and to, and to the customers. So the, the, the reasons not to do it are pretty slim. And also you pointed out that, you know, you had some people who uh, dismiss your brand uh, due to its... Um, what they call a childish nature, which, and it just reminded me my, I was talking to my mom about a Halloween costume I wanted to put together and go uh, downtown. Uh, this was two years ago. And she says, yeah, I, I thought you would have outgrown it by now. I says, outgrown it. You know, we're all oh, going to yeah. die. Right. Yeah. Like, 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 yeah. Like, again, like build your own brand. Don't build my brand. You know, like it, like, like, like do, do your own thing. Here's the thing. you like, like, like good culture does not mean everyone. It doesn't even mean everyone has to be nice. You know, there's, there's certain, uh, the, I think it's Pepsi, where if you're on five and Pepsi, you've got to step on everyone's head to get to the top and you've got to fight your way there. Honestly, like, if that's a culture, they hire people who fit that and you like that, great. Strong brand, strong culture. Like, they've obviously done very well. So it's not about being nice. It's about having a single purpose, a single type of purpose, pur- purpose, a single type of person. Purpose. <laughs> person and purpose. Purpose. Okay. Um, that fits together, yeah. So, so, so hire correct for you. I hire correct for what I believe is right. And because we are more of a creative industry, we have to push that. Like, like we need to. If you're a wealth manager, I mean, the, be- the best wealth manager I know is, is a little bit crazy, um, but maybe that's not right for you. So, so again, like have your brand, know what it is, internal, external, the same, and then like double down. Like focus is always better for business anyway. It's always better for ROI because it's much simpler and easier to do. Mm. All right, so I got, uh, I got a wrap-up question for you, and but I've got one more chambered. Um, this is more of like a, a back a background question for you, um, and, I'll, and I'll frame this be, just so that you know exactly how I want uh, I want you to think about the answer to this. So um, the first person to answer this question in a way that stuck out to me was uh, Paul Motley. He's a uh, affiliate uh, expert, and he went to university for chemistry. And I asked him, did his chemistry background come with him in any way? 
And he said, yeah, it gave me a way to break things down on a fundamental level, look at things at their elements, and then put it back together. Uh, so I pose you that same question. Um, what was your background prior to any of this? And was there any skills that have come with you and are still with you to this day? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm an industrial designer. So I was doing physical product design for years, consultancy. Um, we designed that company. So we put design at the top of the funnel of how we work internally. And you can see this, this comes through in our brand. It comes through in the way that we build products. It comes through in the way that we talk to customers and understand customers and build things for it. So I'd say yeah, a lot of companies in my space are, t- are technology led, a lot of sales led, we're design led. And I'm biased, but I think that's, I think that's a pretty good way to go. Um, so yeah, like I spend very little time doing design these days, but it's, it's in that ethos and it's how we approach problems. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, terrific. All right. Well, that's everything I've got for you today. Uh, I have to say this has been, as I predicted, this put a piece of the econ puzzle together for me. And and I thank you for that. Uh, I thank you for your time. Um, and so the last thing that I uh, give, sorry, I'll give you the floor one more time to do two things. One is to just remind customers, or <laughs> I guess potentially customers, uh, anybody who's interested, uh, how to check you out. And then if you have any parting words of wisdom or anything else that we uh, for maybe forgot to mention, maybe something I forgot to ask you, any last words you want to leave us with, uh, this is the chance to do it. Yeah. So if you want to try out personalized video messaging, uh, check out Bonjuro. It's free. Get on board. Connect your Shopify and you're away. If you need help, let us know. Uh, but parting words of wisdom, we have, we have an ethos that we live by, which is automate processes but never relationships. Uh, and I would think about that and think about it properly. Um, the human, the point, the point of process and operations is to remove everything that you as a human don't have to do, so that you can invest in the things that only a human can do. I think when you look about customers and relationships, that that's that's down to you. That's a great way of looking at it. And and one thing I'll say uh, just to tack on to that too is that um, with the way technology is going to uh, change our lives, my God, these next ten years, who knows? And. And I don't approach it with any kind of fearfulness because I think it's going to make the human experience more human by allowing technology to focus on the human experience and not the experience where we're doing the work that a machine should be doing anyways. Absolutely. You nailed it. Terrific. All right. Thanks for listening. Uh, Matt Burnett, once more, thank you for your time. And we will check in with everybody next episode. So stay tuned. Thanks for listening. You might have found this show on many number of platforms. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, or right here on Debutify. Whatever the case, if you enjoy this content and want to help us thrive, please take a few moments to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you think is best. We also want to hear from you, so whether you think you'd be a good guest or want to weigh in on anything related to our show, you can email podcast at Debutify.com or connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Finally, this podcast is created by the passionate team at Debutify. If you're ready to take the plunge into e-commerce or are looking to up your game, head over to Debutify.com and see how we can change your life and the lives of many through what you do next.